Welcome. Welcome. Hi, welcome to Christ Central. 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 Good morning, Christ Central. I'm Andrew, and I'm one of the pastors here. And it's so great that you can tune in and join us today for our online worship service. Uh, if you have children, we also have our Christ Central Kids worship videos that will be available on our YouTube page, and you can feel free to watch that with your families after this service. If you're new, we'd love to connect with you and get to know you a little bit better, and you could help us to do that by filling out a Connect card on our website. And for every Connect card that is filled out, Christ Central will donate $10 to a local nonprofit that you can choose from a list. So help us to get to know you, uh, warmly welcome you, connect with you, and also connect with our community. When it comes to offering, you can give online by text or by mail. Today, I have just two important announcements for us. Our first is about our upcoming indoor worship service. I'm super excited, and I'm sure many of you are as well. We will resume our indoor worship services on June 27. And these worship services will include adults, uh, the youth, as well as the children and nursery. And it'll be at the Fullerton campus at 10 a.m. on Sundays. Plans for the Artesia campus uh, are in the works and will be made uh, available as soon as we're ready. And we will definitely want to prioritize the safety of all of our members here. And so we're closely following California's reopening guidelines, effective June 15th. For those of you who are unable to attend, we will continue to live stream our services and they will be available online for you to watch. And our education ministry worship uh, will also be available online for you to watch at home. Uh, We know that many of you are excited, we are as well, but would you please also keep us in prayer as we make important decisions, as our leadership makes uh, the necessary adjustments as we try to transition into reopening as best as we can. Our second announcement is related, but as we reopen, we also will need more volunteers. As we prepare to reopen on June 27th, there are many ministries that are going to require volunteers And we are currently so grateful for all of you who are already serving. Thank you so much. We so appreciate uh, just your time, your commitment, and your investment into our church. We really wouldn't be where we are today without you. For the others of you who've been wondering, maybe how can I get involved? How can I serve and help? Well, we have many ministries that are in need, such as the church operations team, our worship operations children's ministry, welcoming, and and other ministries as well. And so if you're interested, if you'd like to help out, if you'd like to be a part of serving at Christ Central, please visit our website, christcentralsc.com slash volunteer. For all of these announcements or any other announcements, you can visit our website, sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. Follow us also on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Spotify. Today, our call to worship comes from Hebrews 13, verse 14 to 15. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Each Sunday, God invites us into his presence as his people, and we're reminded that despite the busyness of our lives and everything we have going on, this world is not our home. It is not our lasting city. But we do get a glimpse of where our home actually is, as well as who our spiritual community and family is. And that's what we're doing every Sunday as we worship together. Would you join me now? Let's praise our Father in heaven with these next songs. strength there is strength within the sorrow there is beauty in our tears you meet us in our mourning with a love that 
the cast out fear You are working in our waiting You're sanctifying us When beyond our understanding us to trust your plans are still to prosper you have not forgotten us you're with us in the fire and the flood you're faithful forever perfect in love you are sovereign Promises are mighty light. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. You're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign. Each Sunday, we want to take intentional time to confess our sins together. Romans 5.12 reads, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. I think for many of us, death is the clearest picture that this world is not 
how it ought to be. And it's a reminder that it's not how it ought to be because of us, because of our sin. All of us have sinned, and maybe there are things this week that come to mind. This is our opportunity where God invites us to lay those things at his feet, to confess our sins together. Would you join me now? Let's confess all of our sins honestly, vulnerably before our God. Would you now hear these comforting words, Romans 5, verse 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, in confessing our sins, we're reminded today that Jesus came to deal with them, that he would live the perfect life we couldn't and die the death we deserved to save us. And I know many of us maybe believe this, we believe God loves us, but when we look at how we actually relate to God, often we believe his love is maybe filled with disappointment. Disappointment that we keep on struggling with the same sins. Disappointment that our resolve isn't as strong as it ought to be, to do better, to be better. And yet we somehow seem not to be able to do that. Well, then Romans 5, 8, I hope this sits well in your soul. Jesus loved you while you were still a sinner, right? while you still wanted nothing to do with loving him. He loved us then, and he'll love us now. His love was unconditional for us then. Why would it be conditional for us now? Would you be reminded this morning his love for you doesn't expire? It doesn't run out because God didn't choose you first because you were oh so high. And so he's not gonna leave you when you feel oh so low. Will we rejoice in that truth that God loves you? Would you feel and experience the reality of that love for you even this morning? And would you rejoice in that love as we sing this next song of praise to him? Oh 
This time, we're going to confess our faith together. And we're currently going over the Westminster Shorter Catechism, and it is basically a question and an answer form of the core teachings that we believe. Today, we're going over question 25. This is a question. I'm going to read it for us. Let's read the answer together. Question 25, how does Christ carry out the office of a priest? Together, Christ carries out the office of a priest in offering up himself as a sacrifice one time to satisfy divine justice and to reconcile us to God and in making continual intercession for us. Welcome to CCSC Worship Online. I'm Harold, one of the pastors. We've been going through the Gospel of Mark, and we come to Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. This is the parable of the tenants. So let's give our full attention to this. I'll read it first, starting at verse 1. And he, Jesus, began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant. And they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another. And him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one, to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. This is God's word so far. 
I come across many new parents who say that they're going to be nothing like their parents. They are intentional and determined to become nothing like their parents. Now, if you look upon what your parents did with you, and it only brings up feelings of resentment, or you've been deeply hurt, or perhaps for some of you, you romanticize how good your parents were. If you don't deal with all of what has really happened, if you don't deal with it honestly, if you don't deal with gospel resources, it actually affects you more than you know. Right? Psychologists, counselors, doctors, textbooks will tell you this is called repression. If something is there and you don't admit that it's there, you and I continue to repress it. It actually controls us more than we know. Now, according to the Holy Scriptures, underneath all of our repressions, there's something else. There's something else. According to Romans chapter 1, there is a repression of all repressions. It actually is more active. It's more intentional. It's persistent. It's a suppression. It's a suppression. It's holding down a truth in unrighteousness. And that truth being that there is a God and we actually live as creatures under him. If this is something that we don't want to see, if this is something we don't want to deal with, if we don't want to admit that it's even there, it actually ends up dominating you and I. And this is why actually Jesus tells this parable. Four character studies for us today. Just four characters we're going to look through. The key characters in the story that Jesus told. First, the owner and tenants. First two characters, owner and tenant. Uh, and the tenants. Jesus is picking upon the reality in Jewish Galilee in the first century where there were expansive land estates of wealthy owners and the peasantry who were starved to own their own land who worked that land as tenant farmers. Jesus, of course, masterfully uses a real-life class warfare, animosity among the classes to expose his enemies and how much they hate him and how they are plotting to take his own life. The owner of the vineyard in this parable is obviously God. He did all the initial work and investment. We read that the owner planted it, set it up. Then the owner went on to cultivate and guard it. By putting a fence, you see that? Then he dug a pit. In addition to that, built a tower. That's for a watchman to guard against predatory animals or thieves to run off with the produce of that vineyard. Then, last but not least, the owner leased, leased this vineyard to tenants. So, of course, the owner, as God started everything, takes the risk by entrusting it to tenants and now evidently is living abroad according to the story Jesus told. And at the proper time in verse 2, when it was in season, the owner sends a servant to collect, quote, just some of the fruit, some of the fruit, which is rightfully his. You know, cream of the crop or some of the produce. Maybe this was rent. But the tenants were defiant. In fact, the tenants were downright hostile. And servant after servant after servant that the owner sends, they ultimately kill his own son. Now, why is Jesus telling this parable and who is Jesus talking to? The first and immediate audience are the religious leaders of Israel. Jesus is exposing the religious, spiritual, professional leaders in the figure, in the character of the tenants. The second and broader audience, of course, I think applies to all of us 
to whom everything has been given on loan, but we live and act as if we are the owners. You know, owners get to say, I like this, I don't like that. I decide what is right or wrong. I get to determine what's in my best interest. What would work for my long-term welfare? Tenants, however, don't get to say any of those things. Tenants ought to put someone else's wishes, orders, and welfare before their own. The second and broader audience, all of us who are actually tenants but want to live and act like owners. See, what kind of world do we really live in? I ask that question. I am not asking the question as, what kind of world do you like or prefer to live in? No, I'm asking the question, what kind of world do you actually live out? Are we owners or are we tenants? Well, if we're ultimate owners, then, yes, we get to create and agree upon common laws, and we can hold people accountable who defy or violate those laws. If we are the ultimate owners, we come up with our own laws. But what if the majority, the majority of humanity, <clears throat> decides that, well, I think we should have all the power and keep it forever. What if the majority decides genocide is actually perfectly reasonable and economically profitable? What if the majority decides, oh, well, sex trafficking should occur, we'll try to keep it hush-hush, even with underage boys and girls, but as long as it just never gets found out. Without God, if we are the ultimate owners, there's actually nothing higher to appeal to. For those of you who say, well, I'm not sure if there may be a God or may there may not be a God. I'm always going to be undecided, ride the fence on this. You know, agnosticism here at this point doesn't help at all either. Yale Law professor by the name of Arthur Leff, he observed, quote, napalming babies is bad. Starving the poor is wicked. There is such a thing as evil. All together now, says who? You see, Professor Leff, as a non-believer, admits that without God, all moral valuations are subjective and internal. There is no external higher moral standard by which a person's feelings and values are to be judged. So my friends, which world can you actually live in? To be owners, masters, rulers of the universe, this means you cannot objectively call out what is wrong or evil. There is no basis for equal human rights. No higher court of appeals. Is this the world you really want or you can actually live in? Here's what Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 2. He says, every single one of us, deep down in our consciences, know, but we try to just keep holding it down, repress it and suppress it, that we are not the owners. There is another owner. We are the tenants. And there is such a thing as objective right versus wrong. And insofar as we try to keep up that illusion, hold down the truth with all of our mights, this actually explains why we are all so anxious, so scared, so troubled, so worried, why we are so messed up. Because that illusion is so fragile. And all these things happen to shatter it. The owner is God. The tenants are the religious leaders of Israel, but broadly applied, the tenants are all of us who are trying to live like owners. Third character study, the servants, the servants. Notice how the first servant is set, sent, and he's just literally beat up. I mean, beat up by the vine dressers or the tenants in charge of this vineyard. And then the hostility just escalates. Another servant is sent, but he is now struck upon his head and then sent away shamefully. And then some are actually killed. 
Look, look at verses 3 to 5 once again. I hope you have your Bibles in front of you. Look at verses 3 to 5. That is Jesus replaying the tragic history of the entirety of the Old Testament. Notice how many were sent by the owner. You see, the servants are prophets sent by God. One after the other, one after the other, one after the other. Issuing warnings and pleas and appeals on behalf of the owner. You cannot continue to go this way. The vineyard, taken from Isaiah chapter 5, is actually the very people of God. And then again, the tenants here, or the vine dressers, are religious leaders who are not only unreliable, but completely wicked. They do not care about the vineyard or the people of God whatsoever. They do not care about the owner's wishes or welfare. They're only in it for their own gain. They defy and actually hate the owner so much that they end up killing his son who has the rightful inheritance. You know, all kinds of people not only suffer from COVID, but they suffer from abuse. And it's all the more devastating and sinister when the abuse comes from spiritual leaders. You know, in the Gospel of John, Jesus speaks of he is the good and true and faithful shepherd. And we have launched our shepherding ministry so that we would individually love and care and pray for you. But Jesus also warns at the same time, there are wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. Abuse is all the more traumatic when it comes from people who are clothed as clergy, pastors, priests, counselors, gurus, guides, coaches, spiritual authorities. And Jesus explicitly warns us against them. How often they actually are only seeking to abuse and devour and destroy all things before them. And they actually end up sometimes protected by shame-based secrecy and silence. You know, unfortunately, if you Google in the name of Julie Royce, she's an investigative reporter. And her mission in life, if you find on the website, is to bring about reform and restoration of the church by uncovering all kinds of cases of abuse. And they are shameful, sometimes shocking, but wholly upsetting. These abuses must be confronted and called out because Jesus does right here in this parable. Seeking justice and truth and accountability is not distorting or ignoring the gospel but seeking to restore it. Yes, indeed, Jesus came to save us all from our sin. Jesus came to save some from all of our sin. But in this parable, he came to condemn and destroy those who continue in it without repentance, without remorse, who actually end up only getting worse. The proof is in verse 12 at the end of this parable. The religious leaders who knew that Jesus was telling this story directly aimed at them, realized that Jesus is trying to expose them, how bone chilling that must have been. And yet, they end up arresting and crucifying him soon thereafter. His immediate and original audience did not melt. They did not change one wit, but in fact, just got worse. Little did they know that Jesus would rise from death. That Jesus would rise from death. And so Jesus offers you and I now to be your savior. Or he will be our judge into eternity. And for every victim, all victims who suffer and wait to this day for justice to be done. Jesus here promises in a surprising twist, you will have your full say because God will have his day. He will have the final word. He will have the final word. Three characters so far, the owner, the tenants, 
third, the servants, who are prophets, messengers sent by God. Last but not least, the owner's son. The treatment of his son. When the son shows up, I mean, it's almost hard to believe, right? They've already beaten and harassed and killed some of the previous servants, but when the son of the owner shows up, all that semi-hidden, simmering, repression and rage just overblows and they kill him and throw him out of the vineyard. Now, who in their right mind would do something like that? Who in their right mind would even think they can get away with that? Well, you know the one time in history that God himself dared to show up in the most vulnerable, physical way. His own son did end up being arrested, tortured, and killed. The treatment of his son is only a reflection of the treatment we want to give to the owner. This is why Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8, verses 7 through 8, articulates the anthropology of Jesus in this parable. Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8 reads, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The natural, instinctive, OG, original mindset is, cannot, will not submit to the owner who is God. You see, sinfulness is not just breaking some rules here and there. It is a whole way of life filled with enmity, hostility. You and I naturally will do everything in our powers to get rid of God as God because we want to be the owners. So by that famous author, Aldous Huxley admitted, quote, I didn't want the universe to have meaning. I wanted there not to be a God because I wanted to sleep with whomever I wanted to sleep with. See, underneath even our intellectual arguments or excuses or defenses and smoke screens that we raise up is an underlying deeper rage. It is a rebellion. It's a resentment. My friend, it is a downright hatred for the idea that there is a God over me to whom I owe, I am obligated to, that I must actually seek to live under his orders for his welfare. So what does the owner do? Oh, make no mistake here. What does Jesus illustrate and tell us clearly that the owner of the vineyard ends up doing? Thankfully, he does not destroy the vineyard, who is the people of God, but he does destroy the vine dressers. Those in upper middle management, the religious leaders, the professional clergy, those who take the name of Jesus and actually use it in the worst possible ways, he does come to destroy them. You know, if I get to pick and choose what Bible passages uh, I get to study and preach and deliver to you, um, this certainly would not be the one. And Jesus is telling me and all my fellow pastors and ministers on our staff and every ministry and church across the world, beware, beware, please take heed of believing the lie that God owes you something because he called you and used you before. That the church or ministry that you serve in currently is yours. Beware. Beware of every deluded and being comfortable with this thought that, oh, well, being a spiritual leader is a right. I'm entitled to that now. No, it's not. It's a privilege. 
It's an act of sheer grace. It's not a guarantee that any of us will last. Sad to say, my friends, would you continue to cover me and all of your pastors and staff with much prayer and encouragement and accountability as well. I can't even begin to tell you in this season how many have fallen or have had to resign or walk away. And because it's this, when you are given that position of a vine dresser or religious leader, your very powers or your very performance or your production or popularity or even your public piety might actually be the very things that is getting in the way of you and I seeing that this parable is about you. It could be about me. And this is why at the end, Jesus quotes Psalm 118, verses 22 to 23. Look at verses 10 and 11. I'll read it for us. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is most polarizing. Here's what Jesus is saying at the end of the story. You can reject Jesus as a stone of judgment. You can re- he can be the rejected stone, or Jesus can become the cornerstone of a new and abundant life. What makes all the difference? What's the X factor? Here it is. I'll try my best to explain. Christians are people who no longer repress their deep natural hatred for God. But they admit it and they're actively trying to get rid of it and all of its traces. See, listen close, my friends. If you never see and admit that you are naturally an enemy of God, you will stay an enemy of God. But if you begin to see and admit that you have hatred for God as God, that you are a tenant who seeks to live like an owner, if you begin to see and admit that, and you turn and you trust Jesus as your Savior, he will become the cornerstone of your life from this point into forevermore. See, what does this parable have to do with you? (laughs) Well, what do you do with this parable? It just boils down to this. What are you doing with all of his prophets and messengers that he sends? Ultimately, what are you doing with his son? You know that friend or that roommate or that seemingly random pastor or counsel you come across or that family member who really has been praying for you? Do you know what all of them combined have been trying to tell you? I'll summarize it. I'm pretty sure of it if they're a Christian person. They've all been trying to tell you, you're not the owner. You're not the owner. You're not the owner. You're a tenant. And if you have a hard time believing in what messengers, faithful and true, there are far more faithful and true messengers sent by God than false ones, those who act like wolves. But if you have a hard time listening to what they say, then God in his love might actually come after you to show you, to show you that what they are saying is indeed so true. Because when life doesn't go according to your plans, the longer you live, you begin to wake up and fully realize, huh, no matter how smart or how hard I try or how much money I throw at this thing, Life just doesn't cooperate with me. You see, that might be God showing you. What is he showing you? There's an ultimate owner. You're not him. You're not in control. You know, I've always been fascinated by the character of Mike Tyson, the former most scariest undisputed heavyweight champ of the world. And on a recent documentary, he is asked, what would the 54-year-old Mike Tyson Tell the 20-year-old Mike Tyson. Here's what he said. Man, he's an astute philosopher. He said he would tell this 20-year-old self, life is going to hurt. Life is going to really hurt. What do you do when life really hurts? Oh, you can let it harden you. You can make it let you, make you more arrogant and proud. Or you can allow it to humble you to bring you down, 
to the appropriate level. My friends, your life really isn't yours. Your capabilities aren't yours. Your income isn't yours. Your business isn't yours. Your spouse isn't really yours. Your family isn't yours. Your health and successes aren't really yours. All the opportunities you've had in life isn't yours. How you're coming out of the pandemic isn't actually owned or controlled by you. It's all on loan. It's all on loan. So the question is, just what are you doing with it? What are you doing with his messengers? What are you doing with his son? Are you repenting or resisting? Are you continually offended or melted and humbled? I want to tell you, the son of the owner of owners, Jesus Christ himself, ended up being treated like an enemy for you. He was treated in the worst way. He was killed and thrown out for you. He died. Jesus died to love and save you and someone like me. How could it be harmful in any way to lose all controls to him? Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, we thank you for this parable. We thank you for the richness and the power and the piercing insight of the stories your son told. And I pray, oh God, you would take this over by the power of your spirit and speak to each of us and apply it deep and change lives. Oh Lord, may each of us not seek to kill and get rid of the son, the son of God, but kiss the son, worship and adore, and bend the knee and confess that he is Lord of lords my savior from sin, my beautiful king. Oh, Lord, may it be so. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. A gift of grace. A gift of grace. Is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, to this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing all these mighty and not I, but through Christ in me. So the night is dark. But I am not forsaken For by my side the Savior he will stay I labor on in weakness and rejoicing For in my need his power is displayed To this I hold my shepherd will It has been paid for Jesus' blood and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold my sin has been defeated. Jesus now. Sing, I am free and not I, but through Christ.
follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home, and day by day I know he will renew me, until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I Now receive this benediction. May the love of God who is our Father in heaven and the grace of the Lord of lords and Savior of sinners, Jesus Christ, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.